Like I said earlier, it's good to be back here at First Baptist Church. My wife and family and I were out of town last week in Chicago uh, visiting my brother there, spending some time there and just some time with the family, some uh, relaxation time. And it's good to see people back from vacation. It's about that time of year. Get the last little hurrah in there. And school, unfortunately, young people, school starting soon, a couple weeks from now at BBA. That'll be wonderful. Parents are cheering and kids are mildly interested in school. And we're excited here at First Baptist Church. I mentioned Tuesday night uh, that my wife had gotten tagged or hit with a 2 by 8 And I found out that some of you thought I was kidding. All right. And, I'm, and I wasn't kidding. She actually got hit by a 2 by 8 You say, well, what happened, Pastor Howell? I'm about to tell you. So we're building this chicken run, chicken coop, Taj Mahal for chickens at our house. And, and we, because my, my wife is, is a, I mean, she's in there with me. I mean, and so on the one side of it, we're putting up a 2 by 8 and I was putting up, and she was holding the one end of this 16-footer. And uh, the other end, I tagged up with my nail gun, put a couple nails in there, and I went to the middle to, to level it. All right, like you ought to level it. So while I'm leveling it, and I had to screw there to drop one in there, and um, boy, the one end pulled loose. The two nails, Brother Merchant, look at me like, like oh my goodness. The two, end, two nails popped out, and that 2 by 8 smacked right on the head in the middle of the head. And uh, it got her good, good enough where we ran to the urgent care, and uh, I, I am not admitting, Brother Rob, that I drove over the speed limit, but if you had used your radar around me at that time, uh, it would not have been 55 on Dixie Highway. But we got there very quickly, and my wife got seven staples in her head. And she did it without any Novocaine, without a shot. The lady brings in the, the stapler, they got that little stapler, and she goes, well, I don't want a shot. She goes, try it. She goes, can you do it without a shot? And, and the lady's like, sure, you know, I mean, th those nurses don't care at all, do they? And so my wife, she's a tough cookie. I tell you right now, folks, she's tough. She grabbed inside that chair. The lady goes, kung, right in her head with a staple. She goes, okay, do it again. <laughs> All seven, but she did not get a shot. So apparently the shot was worse than the seven staples she got in her head and got them pulled out. So she is doing great and fine. Uh, no concussion. She did not die. There was a whole lot of blood. Johnny King running out. We sent him back in the house. And uh, it was a mess, but I mean, we survived, and she's tough, and uh, we got the chicken coop up, so <laughs> life is good at the Howell house. And uh, now you say, well, did you try to kill your wife, Pastor Howell? No, I did not, all right? I love my wife, all right? But that's the last time she'll back talk. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, <laughs> I, I, I am being, I am just kidding. You know that, I hope you know that. Psalm chapter number one, we're going to finish up this psalm as we look at these power verses. Psalm chapter one, what a tremendous psalm as we've looked at this. And the Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, this blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Just a reminder that when we talked about the description of this blessed man, the Bible says that this man is a prosperous individual. The Bible says he's like that tree. He's prospering in all aspects of life. That does not mean you'll never have any trouble in life. We are not the prosperity gospel church. There are some churches out there that preach that if you just give to the church, then God will bless you and you'll have no problems in life. Well, I read my Bible, I find out that people served and loved God and still had some problems. But you do have the grace of God that takes you through that. You find some prospering in a biblical level. And uh, the Bible says this man who delights in God's word, this individual, is a prosperous individual. But then verse number four says this, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. As we finish up this psalm today, I want to finish up, I call this sermon, Two Roads. Two Roads. See, the first sermon we looked at was leaves of three, let them be. There's groups of, of individuals, counsels to avoid, the sitteth in the seat of the scornful, or, or uh, standeth in the way of sinners. Or in the counsel of the ungodly. There's things to avoid. There's things to the description. But now we come down to two roads. And the, the end of the psalm ends up with two vastly different locations. You have the end of the godly, the righteous, the blessed man. The description who delights in God's word and follows his way. And you have the, the description, the end of the, the ungodly. 
You see, we can say this, these two roads do not end up in the same spot. You can't live, you can't live differently according to the Bible and end up in the same place as the way the Bible teaches. It doesn't work that way. Yet there are people all over the universe, all right, over the world, who say, listen, I can do things my way and have true peace, but the Bible says you only have that God's way. You say, listen, I can have true joy if I follow this particular pattern or this thought process, but God says you have to do it my way. You see, there are two roads. We're in Chicago last week, and we rented, I rented a bike for my daughter and myself, and my boys and wife brought their bikes. We went along, I think it's Lake Michigan there, if I'm not mistaken, about 20 miles you can ride, and we rode about 12 of it as a family. My daughter's just learning how to ride a bike, and so I, I rented a bike, and then one of these, they're called like wee-hoos, they ride behind, and, and she can pedal along with me. The pedaling makes no difference to the bi- person driving the bicycle. In fact, after about six or five or six miles, I got off, and I said, man, Danielle, I'm wore out here. She goes, Daddy, I'm tired too. <laughs> I said, Danielle, what are you doing? I'm pedaling, Daddy. Okay. All right, Danielle, you're not pedaling. You're sitting there riding along with me. <laughs> but we got back there where I dropped off at the bike rental. It's right there on, uh, oh boy, it's Ontario Street, I think, right in there, that corner. And I called a, an Uber driver. All right, anybody used Uber? It's not real popular. It's somewhat in Michigan, but other locations, Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, where I've been in, in Chicago, I use Uber. And uh, they're very handy. I mean, you know, you can get around everywhere. So I, I had my app out and I, I called this Uber driver or lined him up, but he came. I didn't see the vehicle in it, and it said he was right there. All right? And so he called me and he said, Hey, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the spot. And I said, I don't see you anywhere. He said, I'm at this corner and this corner. I said, well, that's where I'm at. You know, I'm right there. He goes, well, I, you know, where are you? I said, well, let me try to get to you. I began to walk. And I don't know about you, but I typically am directionally challenged. All right, some of you have this innate gift of north, south, east, and west, and you're like a road. My dad's like an atlas, okay? I call him Rand McNally. Not me. I use Google and uh, Google Maps to survive in life. Okay? You're like, Brother Howell, that's terrible. It just is. Okay? It just is. I can fix a computer, but you tell me which way is north. I'm like, well, the sun is there. It's setting there. And about five minutes later, I'll figure out which direction I'm going. But when I have to decide in 23 seconds, the chances are I'm going the wrong way. So he said, I'm right here. So I began to walk, and I got one block. And he's like, do you see me? I said, I don't see you. And then I looked out at my map, and I flip it around on Google, and I realized I just went the wrong way. He's like, I'm about to leave. I'm thinking, I don't want to walk back almost a mile in Chicago. Uh, I, I want to ride back with my daughter. I said, Danielle, we got to run. She goes, okay, Daddy. So we take, and we start running, and she's running with me. And we come around the corner and go another block when I came, and then back, and then came around the corner, and there's the guy. We jumped in the car. Whew. I said, Danielle, good run. She goes, Daddy, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> the point is this. The guy was over, the Uber driver was over there. I was walking that way. I could have walked an awful long time. And yes, I realized that eventually if I walked around the entire world, the globe, I would come to him. I realized that. But for the sake of argument, can we say this? There was no way I was walking that way and getting over there. I cannot go there and end up there. That is what this psalm as it ends up is talking about. There are two roads. There are two endings. There's the ending of the ungodly. We're going to look at that this morning. And there's the the ending of the righteous man. There's a poem, the two roads diverged in a yellow wood. The poem goes on to say, Sorry I could not travel both. I would bring the idea that there are two roads in this psalm. They are polar opposites. First of all, I see the contrast in this passage, the contrast The Bible says this in verse number 3, that the righteous man, he's like a tree. But then, in verse number 4, the contrast, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, the Bible words. You see see, see that word, the Bible word, the chaff? I am not a farmer, never been a farmer, and maybe never will be a farmer. Never grown wheat, never been around wheat. So I had to look up what exactly is chaff. Now, some of you already know what that is, and that's wonderful. You're intelligent people. You probably also north, south, east, and west as well, okay? Thankfully, I had Google again to look up what chaff is. Found out that on wheat, there's a, a covering to the wheat. It's called the chaff. And they will, they will thresh the wheat, they will kill the wheat, and, and then they will, they will get it out 
uh, away from it, and it'll separate from it, and in order to separate it, they will toss up the wheat called winnowing up into the wind. And as they toss this wheat up, the wind, the chaff is so light, the wind just blows it away. You see, the Bible makes comparison of the righteous person being like a tree and the unrighteous, the ungodly, like this lightweight chaff. They are not the same thing. You see, there are two restaurants out there that both serve beef, but they are not the same. One is called Outback Steakhouse, and one is called McDonald's. And if you ate an Outback Steakhouse and then ate a McDonald's, you would not confuse one with the other, would you? As you ate into that McDouble, you would not say, oh, is this ribeye? You would probably say, oh, is this meat? You don't confuse the two. Both serve meat and both serve fries, but they are not the same. The Bible is saying this tree and this chaff, though they are both plants, they are not the same. They are different. There is a contrast. The godly is not like a tree. The tree is non-withering. The, the tree prospers. The chaff is... I have a few statements about this contrast. The tree stands proud and strong while the chaff is tossed up to be blown away. The tree stands proud and strong while the chaff is just tossed up to be blown away. But like the chaff which the wind driveth away. I mentioned two weeks ago when I talked about the description of the blessed man that there's a strength of a tree. That when the storms of life come, as you're grounded in God's word and the principles and the truths of God's word, those storms will come. But God's strength, his foundation, will keep you strong in the storm. It's not in my strength, it's in his strength. But the Bible shows us this chaff, there is no strength, there is no foundation, there are no roots, they just blow away we're surrounded by people with problems sometimes marriages are blown apart like chaff which the wind driveth away why are we divorced irreconcilable differences what does that mean it's we can't get along there are people who take their own life the chaff which the wind driveth away. You see, there's a contrast of the tree which stands proud and strong with the strength from God's word and the chaff which has no strength to withstand even the slightest breeze. You can't help but look around the world and even this past week in the news there's some awful events of, of the world happening and you wonder, how can someone walk through that without the strength of God's word? And the Bible says you can't. Blown away with the wind. But see, when someone is like a tree, they can withstand like Job. You see, Job had some terrible things happen in his life, some things that we would say were travesties and tragedies. Yet there was a strength there. Why? Because of his relationship with God. We read about that in James. We, behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience or the endurance of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, which is pitiful and of tender mercy. Not only does a tree stand proud and strong, but the tree provides many benefits. But the chaff is just good to be tossed away. You see, as I look at verse number 3, and look at this tree, there's a, the fruit in its season, there's a leaf that doesn't wither, and there's a prospering, there's a picture of a vibrant tree providing some good things for those around it. And then you have this chaff, which is just driven away, no good to just but be tossed away. In my research of chaff, I found out that there is two uses for it. It can, one, be sometimes used as a slight substitute to feed animals or be burned as fuel, but it's a terrible fuel. It just burns up just like that. It's like a flash in the night. It's just a, a light help. It's only minimal at best. But I read in my Bible that righteousness brings life. Proverbs 21, 21. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life and righteousness and honor. I find out when I read about Abraham talking with the Lord that righteousness could have saved a city. I find benefits to righteousness, but the chaff is just to be tossed tossed away, only minimal use at best. I see that the tree is bearing fruit and reproducing, but the th chaff has been threshed. It's doing nothing. And then I see that the tree is prosperous, but the chaff is in a state of decay. 
You see, the picture of the tree is one full of life, full of vigor, but the chaff is one without life, without, in, in, without vigor, lying in waste on the, on the threshing floor. It's internally dried up and empty. And if that does not d- describe people out there without Jesus Christ, I don't know what does. In fact, I found this simple article from, from an unsafe person. There's some biblical truths. It says, 11 simple ways to be happy. You see, people all around are looking to be happy, and yet the Bible says, blessed is the man. Happiness, this is what the psalm is talking about, and yet this blog said 11 simple ways to be happy. I was disappointed as I read these 11 ways to be happy. I want to share a few this morning. They said things like this. They said, stop waiting to be happy. So 11 ways to be happy, stop waiting to be happy. I guess they mean to start being happy like a faucet, right? I will turn on my happy faucet today and I will not wait any longer for it. Add happiness to your life right now. Well, that's why someone's reading this article, right? Because they want to add happiness to their life right now. But they say, you want to add happiness, so add it to your life. Well, if I knew how, I wouldn't read this article in the first place, right? Add happiness to your life right now. Make self-care part of your routine. Get yourself sorted out so that me time can be as effective as possible. Get in a joyful state of mind. Surround yourself with positive people. Now that's actually found in a biblical principle. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Laugh more. And then this one is the one that caught my attention. Find bliss in a bucket list. Find bliss in a bucket list. You see, the bucket list was made popular a few years back where there's your bucket list before you die, the things you want to do. And people will put crazy things on their bucket list. I want to cliff dive. I want to jump out of an airplane without a parachute. All right, that is the bucket list. Because <laughs> you'll be done then. I want to eat at this restaurant, visit this city, and, and accomplish this goal. And, and then I can die fulfilled. And they think that somehow if they check off this bucket list, then life will be full. And it was so intriguing. It was like the author of this blog gave us an insight into their heart. They said this about the finding bliss in a bucket list. Each time I complete one of these checked boxes, there is a moment. Sometimes it only lasts a flash of a second, but on the lucky days it lingers for hours or minutes. It's a moment, a fleeting moment, where I can honestly say that I found bliss. From my fingers to my toes, nearly bursting with life and purpose. It's amazing. It's perspective changing. And in the moment, it's like being alive. I thought, how sad. How sad that the advice that this particular blog writer said was you can find happiness if you check something off your bucket list and it may only last a second. It may be just a fleeting moment, but in that second, you will feel alive. I thought, how sad, because I looked for this sermon. Psalm chapter 1 says, listen, you don't have to have just a second of enjoyment or bliss. You can have a lifetime of it, because the Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh this way. Blessed is the man, happy is he. I don't have to just check something off my list and hope that for just a second or a moment, I'll feel it from my toes to my fingertips. I can walk with Jesus Christ, and every single day I can have his peace, his love, and his joy. See, the contrast, it's a lot, it's different, the chaff and the tree. But I also see two, two similarities. I see the comparison. There is something common between these two things. The Bible says in verse number 6 that the Lord knoweth the way of the, of the righteous. By implication, he knows the way of the ungodly as well. The Lord knows the beginning from the end. The Lord knows everything. You can't beat the Lord. The Lord has all knowledge. He is the author of all knowledge. And in the nature of this psalm, he is giving us the detailed analysis of these two types of individuals. The Lord knows the way of both the righteous and the ungodly. This past Thursday, my family and I took a trip to Crossroads Village down there in the Flint, Montrose, or Mount Morris, I think, area. Well, if you haven't been there, I, I had not been there for years. And we had a great time with the family, rode the train, rode the boat, but they had a magic show. 
I don't know if you enjoy illusions or magic shows. I typically do. I, I like to see how they're going to do that. And I like to, to try to figure out how they're doing what they're doing. Does anyone else like to do that? Or is it just, am I by myself? And, and this guy was pretty good. It was just a small magic show, about maybe 10 of us in there. And he did some neat things. And, and we figured out some. It was really enjoyable with my children who maybe don't have the experience of life and can't figure out. And they're like, wow, that's, that's amazing how they do that. I couldn't help but think about this, this passage because sometimes life seems like a conundrum, like a magic trick. How does it all work out? Well, you know what? We have someone who tells us. We have someone who tells us how it all works out. It's not a trick. It's not magic. God says, I know what will happen. I know what you can do. I know how it ends. I know both the way of the righteous and the ungodly. The other comparison is the Lord judges the way of both the righteous and the ungodly and the ungodly. It says that the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Most likely referring to the final judgment, no place for rewards. Sinners will not be named among the righteous. You see, what the Lord has set in motion is set in motion. If you follow Him, you'll find this peace, this blessing that the Bible promises. If you don't follow Him, you end up like the way of chaff. There is no other option. The Lord judges the way of both the righteous and the ungodly. And lastly, I see the conclusion. I see the conclusion of both the righteous and the ungodly. The way of the ungodly, it's wicked, it's wasted. It's wanton. There is nothing there at the end of the day, except like the Bible says, chaff, which the wind driveth away. The chaff is used also in the Bible in Matthew chapter 3, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn the chaff up with unquenchable fire. Matthew chapter 7, uh, Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, the end of chaff, it only ends in one place, and that is apart from God forever and forever and forever. You cannot live an ungodly life. You cannot live apart from God and don't acknowledge God and follow His way and expect to end up with God. They are two different directions. The Bible makes it clear here that this ungodly is not someone who has trusted Christ as their Savior. The most important thing you can ever do, you can ever do, is to realize that you're a sinner, but that God loves you, Jesus died for you, and by trusting Him and Him alone, He will save you and take you to heaven. That's what these passages talk about, where God says, depart from you, I never, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, what it means is for someone in their time in their life to acknowledge, God, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be in heaven, but I believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? The Bible in John chapter 3, Jesus compares it to being born again. It's not by accident. We can all prove that you are born. We can prove it. You're here today. It's not, I wonder, it's not, maybe I hope so. It's that I know that I've been now born again into God's family. The way of the ungodly. It's wicked, it's wasted, and it's wanton, but I see the way of the righteous. It's full, it's fruitful, and it's founded. The Bible in verse number 6 says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. I see in Psalm chapter 37, verse 18, The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and his inheritance shall be forever. In Job 23, verse 10, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having his, this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You see, maybe you've trusted Christ. God knows the way of the righteous. As he commands in, in 2 Timothy, though, depart from iniquity. The righteous man lives in the light of God. He careful, he's careful who he gains counsel from. He delights in God's word. He's prosperous. The godly man lives apart from God, disregard from God's word, and he ends in disaster. The poem says, Two roads diverge in a yellow wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both. 
And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps a better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for the passing there, had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Some were ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I'm afraid that sometimes we think life will be like that poem. There are two roads, and I'll choose this one, and it'll end up okay, but that one looks equally as good. The Bible says, though, there are two roads, the way of the godly, the righteous, and the way of the ungodly. We don't get two chances. We can follow God's way, end up with life and peace and joy. We can take the way of the ungodly and end up as God's predicted. Lord, I thank you for your word, for this psalm, Lord, who shows us the end of these two roads. I'd ask that you would help us to be honest about which road we're on. Lord, you're a gracious God and full of mercy. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be turned towards you. One would say, Pastor, how is your speaking today? God was speaking to me. I've allowed some influence in my life or realized that I have not been pleasing. But God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning that I would respond to God the way he wants me to? Amen. 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 I wonder if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You can't think of a time where you've asked God to save you. This morning as I was speaking, that something happened inside your heart or your mind and you said, you need to do that. I'd love to pray for you when I pray with the others. If you say, you know what, Pastor Howells, you were speaking, and something was happening. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than anyone else. Slip your hand up, slip it down. I'd love to pray for you. Amen. I see anyone else. Because I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, but I'd like you to pray for me. Oh, Lord, I thank you for this time. I bless this invitation. May we respond the way we ought to in Jesus' name.